That beautiful face and that unbelievable voice. All that helped to make Sinead O'Connor a star. Here's Sinead's story in a nutshell. Born into a conservative Catholic home in Dublin, tough childhood. Her parents split up when she was eight. Uh, her mother is said to have physically abused her. Sinead was in and out of reform schools, arrested for shoplifting, and then tragically, her mother was killed in a car accident. Now, as for Sinead's music career, here's a bit of how it went. I'm dancing. It started out when she did a song with a drummer of an Irish band called Tuanua. Then, started to get a little bit of attention, even from U2's people. Sinead moved to London in 1985, landed a record deal. She put out this album called The Lion and the Cobra, and that got people talking about her. But that just set up what was to come next. Sinead O'Connor released a record called I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, and oh my, did it hit big. Nothing compares. And of course, with the fame came the controversy. Sinead refused to perform in New Jersey if the Star Spangled Banner was played. She bailed on Saturday Night Live because of Andrew Dice Clay's misogyny, and he was the host. And then famously, well, she tore up that picture of the Pope. Fight the real enemy. You know, after all that drama in the press, Sinead O'Connor decided it was time to leave the limelight. But when she left, things didn't get much better. She suffered from depression uh, and at one point even tried to kill herself on her 33rd birthday. But to her, it was about spirituality. And she said that God got her through that and that she hasn't given up on God. Her newest album is called Theology and it's based on many scriptures in the Bible. I want to make something beautiful for you and from you. All right, there's her bio, and here is the woman, Ms. Sinead O'Connor. The um, so you have this record, Theology, which is two records. Yep. Essentially, it's two different versions of the same album, but uh, there's more to it. It's not just you writing songs. The inspiration from this is particularly specific, isn't it? Oh well, they are um, based on or inspired by uh, certain scriptures, particular scriptures. Yeah. Is it all Old Testament stuff? Yes, yeah. apart from one song which kind of alludes to the new one, but mainly Old Testament stuff, yeah. The, um, I mean, the simple question is why? Why that, why that route? Uh, it's just something I wanted to do, really, since I was a kid. Like, I grew up in quite a religious country, and, and there was a lot of religious music around, which was really uncool. Um, so I always figured, since I was a kid, I'd like to make some religious slash spiritual music that wouldn't be embarrassing. But is it you're <laughs> religious by, by birth and by culture, because yeah. in Ireland, I mean, you can't not be. Exactly. It's a, it's a crime. <laughs> yeah. You get locked up. Yeah. Well, when was the last time you cared about that? Well, I've actually managed to commit few crimes in my lifetime. Thank God I didn't get caught for any of them. Well, speaking of crimes, you sing about one. Indeed. Well, that's the only crime I did commit. I used to be a bit of a thief. I used to thief a lot. She, and this is what, how many, how many Christmas Eves ago was this? Oh, well, I, I was bad about four years ago. Uh, she stole, stole a Bible on Christmas Eve. <laughs> and you wrote about it. <laughs> t t that story, tell about that story. Uh, well, I, I had a stack of Bibles. I've been studying religion for years. I have billions of Bibles and di different things. And the trouble is they always make them really big, right? So you can't carry them around in your pocket like or, you know. So I was going through a bit of a rough time. Uh, I was pregnant with my third child. I was about that far away from having him. And um, I was doing my Christmas shopping. And I had a load of bags on me and everything. And I was having a bit of a rough time in life, you know. And I wanted to get a Bible I could put in my pocket, you know. So I found one anyway in the shop, real nice gold thing around the edge and everything. And except when I looked behind me, there was a queue literally of about 200 people. Like so, All buying uh, Bibles? Well, no. Uh, oh, uh, so, but I had, to, I had a chat with God about it there and then. I said, hey, come on. It should be free. Why should anyone have to pay for it anyway? So, so I pilfered it. But I decided, um, well, God isn't getting the royalties, you see. <laughs> So I, I promised I'd do something useful with it. You know? Well, later, have you gone back and at least paid the store? Because now that you're telling everybody this well, story, no, they'll come I after you. I've, I've justified it on the grounds that they're making so much money out of everyone else's books that they don't really need to make it out of the Bible, let's face it. Fair enough. Well, in fact, there are I lots mean, of people... I mean, let's face it, if I say I was living on the street and I had no money and I needed a Bible, then why shouldn't I have one for nothing? God would want you to have one. Exactly. 
Have you had a complicated, would you call it a complicated relationship with God? No, I'd call it a pretty simple one. Complicated relationship with religion? No, uh, perhaps I misunderstood one. You know, I guess obviously if someone didn't know me, they might surmise that, you know, I didn't like religion or something, but actually I do. Like, I, I have a massive um, love for religion, actually. But I suppose, um, not to get too serious or anything, but I would probably separate between God and religion. I say God and religion is too different things, so you relate to them differently, you know. Um, you were diagnosed as bipolar, and, and yeah. how, how long were you feeling this before you actually received? God, I, you know, I think to some extent I had it probably since I was a kid, you know, uh, but it's a sort of a snowballing illness, so it kind of snowballed, and it was around the time four years ago that when I was robbing Bibles, you know. <laughs> I wasn't obviously in the best of health. What was going through your mind when, when you were feeling that, when you were that low? Well, it's a funny little illness because it affects different people differently. Um, some people dress up as Tutankhamun and go shopping, you know. Uh, I, I got very suicidal, which I can laugh about now because it's funny. But it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> but uh, my big thing was uh, I felt suicidal, yeah. Uh, the, the, the stage of your life when you were so young, when you became so famous and uh, intentionally or unintentionally um, controversial, that if you, when you look back at those days, we just passed an anniversary not that long ago, like the 15 year of the Pope thing, and it's a long time ago. Mm. But when people mention your name, that's what gets mentioned all the time still. And yeah. when, you, when you look back at that, that young girl, yeah. what do you think of? Um, uh, God, I suppose you think all, all manner of things. I suppose I'm just the same as anyone who looks back at themselves when they're young. Like, you know, I, I'm very proud of that person. I can see, Jesus, that person was very young. Also, I didn't realize how young I was, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's true that Oscar Wilde thing, isn't it? Youth is wasted on the young. Yeah. You know? I should have worn more short skirts and stuff. <laughs> so because when I look in the mirror now, I think, shit, why didn't I wear them while I could? <laughs> I suppose you, you know. still could, that'd be fine. Well, yeah, later, later yeah. in the dressing room. He has something planned. Yes. <laughs> Which you've been so nice to go along with. I'll do my best. <laughs> the, um, you were at a, uh, you know, when you, when you sort of came on the scene in, in those early days, we were at that period where a lot of musicians weren't saying a lot. They were, a lot of artists were, it was the, pretty happy to live the life. It was very much a, a glamorous life. And, you know, you sort of helped kickstart that movement where artists were actually about things and would say it and would be honest, for, certainly for the generation into the 90s. And I like what was happening politically, and you've read the papers back then, compared to what it's like today. Mm. Can just imagine if you were 22 years old today mm. and coming up and seeing what's happening in the world. Well, I think it's much worse today in the, in the music industry in terms of people being afraid to really say much about much, you know. Uh, but I don't think people like me were the ones that started. I mean, Jesus, obviously, like, way back. No, I'm talking for this next generation, though. Yeah, well, you know, when I um, was around, really, it, it was a time of censorship, especially in the States. You know, there, were, there was bands like the Two Live Crew, having me so horny was banned, which is ridiculous. And all kinds of records were banned, you know. Um, and that's when a kind of real censorship seemed to come into the entertainment industry, you know. Mm -hmm. And it still exists enormously. I have a song that I wrote um, probably 20 years ago. It's called Black Boys on Mopeds. Um, and it's about a particular incident which I was aware of in the city I lived in where, where the police chased a couple of, you know, 11 and 12 year old blokes who they had swiped their cousin's moped, you know, which on paper is stealing, but actually their cousin lived in the house of them and it was like, okay, they robbed the thing, la la la, but they're kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and the police chased them and the, the kids panicked they didn't want their parents to know or whatever and they, they turned around to watch where they're going, smacked into something and died. So I wrote this song about it and, um, one of the lines in the song, it says, these are dangerous days, to say what you feel is to dig your own grave. Mm -hmm. And every time I've sung it uh, lately, the whole audience erupt into applause. And that actually is a sad thing when, when you think about it like that. It is actually a condition, especially in the States, I think, at the moment where artists or everybody are afraid to really challenge anything or say anything about what's going on, like in their own mm -hmm. country, you know, so... Yeah, it, is, uh, it, it was bad, I think, when I started off, but I think it's much worse now. Like most people coming into music business at 20, 22 years of age, they're, they're pretty much told mm -hmm. what to say and what not to say. They're terrified know? they won't be able to sell any more records. Yeah, and because they won't. Yeah. Like, well, you know. did, people held you up as, as a prime example. Do you want to pull a Sinead? Right? And people thought that that's, you yeah. know, be careful what you say. Cause you... Well, see, if you're clever like me, you'll make sure you got the money in the bank before you pull the stunt. <laughs> Did you? Of course I did. I mean, it's stupid. My mama didn't raise no dummy. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I wonder if, 
you know, if you look at it today, and you because you've sort of you've gone a couple of your records have been very spiritual, uh, and you're not as public anymore about that sort of stuff. And I wonder if that's just you, or if it's the media has just kind of moved on and said, you know, oh, both, I guess, you know, like I wouldn't be flavor of the month at the moment, would I? Let's face it. Whatever. So, so you know, they're going to bitch about flavor of the month, you know. Mm -hmm. So they transfer it to people like Britney. Do you, you know? when you when you see these stories though of these, you know, of, of people going through this, do you do you look at them and recognize those moments? And, and and having the benefit of hindsight, do you look back at your career and go, oh, you know what, that's things haven't changed. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you look, I guess the thing for you too is that your personal life became so public for so long, you know, and then and then there's the religion thing. You almost had like a perfect storm of reasons to talk about you. Over and above the music. Well, you know, even if there weren't reasons, the media would create reasons. You know, once you become successful, um, and probably more so when you're a woman, um, you have these people on your back who are determined to make a story out of anything. Like, one of the first kind of controversial story about me was um, I went to play a gig. This is when I was, like, 19 or something. I did a gig in Italy. And I went through the hotel lobby with no shoes on and, and all these newspapers started writing about how I was being challenging and controversial. You were challenging the country of great footwear? You know, exactly, exactly. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you do or what you said, you know, as Bob Marley used to say, you know, they crucified Jesus Christ. Like, if you were Jesus Christ and perfect, they'd kill you. Yeah, that's true. You know? He didn't get off easy. So you may as well be yourself. Like. You love the fact that you're not as famous as you once were? Uh, it makes life a lot easier, definitely. I mean, it means I can do this today and I won't be um, held up for... Whatever you call it, have every word I say mm -hmm. scrutinized or whatever. Yeah, you know. Do you have a plan? Do you have another record in mind? I do. It's called Blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite to theology. That sounds like that might it's be a hit be record. A, a vastly different record. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming Thanks, in. School. Thanks for having me. Shane O'Connor, everybody. <laughs> Got a new record called Theology. Two versions. One recorded in Dublin sessions. One recorded in London. Theology. Shane. Yeah, we'll be right back.